Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove and at Pendika's Park. Now on that occasion a pernicious view had arisen in a monk named Sati, son of a fisherman. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. That view is very much a, a Brahman view. And they, the Brahmins, they like the reincarnation idea and this kind of... Uh, goes into that idea. Several monks, having heard about this, went to the monk Sati and asked him, Friend Sati, is it true that such a pernicious view has arisen in you? And that's kind of an odd question. Do you understand what pernicious means? More like stupid. <laughs> yeah. Exactly so, friends. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. Then the monks, desiring to detach him from that pernicious view, pressed and questioned and cross-questioned him thus. Friend Sati, <coughs> do not say so. Do not misrepresent the Blessed One. It is not good to misrepresent the Blessed One. The Blessed One would not speak thus. For in many ways the Blessed One has stated consciousness to be dependently arisen, since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness. Yet, although pressed and questioned and cross-questioned by these monks, in this way the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, still obstinately adhered to that pernicious view and continued to insist upon it. Uh, sati means mindfulness, and that was a kind of a common name for monks, so they always had them to be the son of this or that. But calling him the son of a fisherman is one of the... Uh, kind of monk jokes because his father was a fisherman but he hated the smell of fish so every time they would say something about Sati son of a fisherman it was kind of a little dig at him <clears throat> Since the monks were unable to detach him from that pernicious view, they went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and told him all that had occurred, adding, Venerable Sir, since we could not detach the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, from the pernicious view, we have reported this matter to the Blessed One. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come, monk, tell the monk Sati, son of a fisherman. In my name the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir. 
he replied, and he went to the monk Sati and told him, the teacher calls you, friend Sati. Yes, friend, he replied, and he went to the Blessed One, after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Sati, is it true that the following pernicious view has arisen in you? As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. Exactly so, venerable sir, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is the same consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not another. What is that consciousness, Sati? Venerable sir, it is that which speaks and feels and experiences here and there the results of good and bad actions. Misguided man, that is a big slap. To whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated in many ways consciousness to be dependently arisen, since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness? But you, misguided men, have misrepresented us by your wrong grasp and injured yourself and stored up much demerit. For this will lead to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, what do you think? Has the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, kindled even a spark of wisdom in this Dhamma and discipline? A spark of wisdom means his understanding of dependent origination. How could he, venerable sir? No, venerable sir. When this was said, the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping, with head down, glum and without response. Then knowing this, the Blessed One told him, misguided men, you will be recognized by your own pernicious view. I shall question the monks on this matter. And 2,600 late years later, we still recognize him for his own pernicious view. So that's pretty strong. Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus, Monks, do you understand the Dhamma taught by me as this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, does? When he... Uh, misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit? No, venerable sir, for in many discourses the Blessed One has stated consciousness to be dependently arisen, since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness. Good monks, it is good that you understand the Dhamma taught by me thus. For in many ways I have stated consciousness to be dependently arisen. Since without a condition there is no origination of consciousness. But this monk Sati, son of a fisherman, misrepresents us by his wrong grasp and injures himself and stores up much demerit for this will lead to his harm and suffering of this misled man for a long time. Monks, consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent on the eye and forms, it is reckoned as eye consciousness. <coughs> When consciousness arises dependent on the ear and sounds, it is reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the nose and odors, it is reckoned as nose consciousness. 
When consciousness arises dependent on the tongue and flavors, it is reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the body and tangibles, it is reckoned as body consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. Just as fire is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When fire burns dependent on logs, it is reckoned as a log fire. When fire burns dependent on faggots, it is reckoned as a faggot fire. When fire burns dependent on grass, it is reckoned as a grass fire. When fire burns dependent on cow dung, it is reckoned as a cow dung fire. When fire burns dependent on chafe, it is reckoned as a chafe fire. When fire burns dependent on rubbish, it is reckoned as a rubbish fire. So too, consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent on when on which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent on the eye and forms, it is reckoned as eye consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the ear and sounds, it is reckoned as ear consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the nose and odors, it is reckoned as nose consciousness. <clears throat> when consciousness arises dependent on the tongue and flavors, it is reckoned as tongue consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on the body and tangibles, it is reckoned as body consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on mind and mind objects, it is reckoned as mind consciousness. Now we have a general questionnaire. Monks, do you see this has come to be? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, do you see its origination occurs with that as nutriment? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, do you see with the cessation of that nutriment what has come to be is subject to cessation? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? Has this come to be? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? Does its origination occur with that as nutriment? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, does doubt arise when one is uncertain thus? With the cessation of that nutriment is what has come to be subject to cessation? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? This has come to be. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, is doubt abandoned in one who sees as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? Has this come to be? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, are you thus free from doubt here? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. 
Monks, are you thus free from doubt here with the cessation of that nutriment? What has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom? This has come to be. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? Its origination occurs with that as nutriment. Yes, venerable sir. Monks, has it been seen well by you as it actually is with proper wisdom thus? With the cessation of that nutriment, what has come to be is subject to cessation. Yes, venerable sir. So he's asking if not only do they know it intellectually, but have they seen actually how this process does work? And they're agreeing with that. Monks purified and bright as this view is, if you adhere to it, cherish it, treasure it, and treat it as a possession, would you then understand the Dhamma taught by the, has been taught as similar to a raft, being for the purpose of cross, crossing over, not for the purpose of clinging and grasping? Yes, venerable sir, monks, purified and bright as this view is, if you do not adhere to it, cherish it, treasure it, and treat it as a possession, would you then understand that the Dhamma has been taught as similar to a raft for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of grasping? Yes, venerable sir. Monks, there are four kinds of nutriment for the maintenance of beings that have already come to be and for the support of those about to come to be. What for? They are physical food as nutriment, subtle or gross. Contact as the second formations as the third, and consciousness as the fourth. Now, I'm, the, the word nutriment means to feed. And when you have a distraction, and you keep your attention on that distraction, you are feeding that distraction so it gets bigger. When you practice right effort, um, some, some people that are practicing other forms of meditation, they're told to watch something until it goes away by itself and then come back to your object of meditation. They are feeding that. For instance, when you're sitting in meditation and a pain arises, what is the instruction for some kinds of meditation? Put your attention right in the middle of that pain and watch its true nature until it goes away. I practiced that kind of meditation for 20 years. I don't recommend doing that. <sighs> what happens? The pain gets bigger and more intense. And it doesn't go away right away. So when you're practicing the six R's, right straight away, you don't keep your attention on that distraction. You release it. You let it be by itself. You relax. You bring up something wholesome, a smile, and come back to your object of meditation. So you're not feeding the distraction. 
And as a result, your mind gets much more clear, much more bright, because you're learning how to let, to let go of craving. <clears throat> Now, monks, these four kinds of nutriment have what as their source, what as their origin, from what are they born and produced? Interesting question. These four kinds of nutriment have craving as their source, craving as their origin. They are born and produced from craving. And this craving has what as its source? What as its origin? From what is it born, is it born and produced? Craving has feeling as its source. So feeling has to arise right before craving arises. Feeling as its origin, it is born and produced from feeling. And feeling has what as its source? What as its origin? From what is it born and produced? Feeling has contact as its source. Contact as its origin, it's born and produced from contact. And contact has what as its source, what as its origin, from what is it born and produced. Contact has the sixfold base as its source, the sixfold base as its origin. It, it is born and produced from the sixfold base. And the sixfold base has what as its source, what as its origin, from what is it born and produced. The sixfold base has mentality materiality as its source, mentality materiality as its origin. It is born and produced from mentality materiality. And this mentality, materiality, has what as its source? What as its origin? From what is it born and produced? Mentality, materiality, has consciousness as its source. Consciousness as its origin. It is born and produced from consciousness. And this consciousness has what as its source? What as its origin? From what is it born and produced? This consciousness has formations as its source. Formations as its origin. It's born and produced from formations. And these formations have what of their source? What is their origin? From what are they born and produced? Formations have ignorance as their source. Ignorance as their origin. They are born and produced from ignorance. What is ignorance? Not knowing precisely how the Four Noble, uh, four noble Truths actually do work. Okay, now, you're going to have to get out your, uh, your, what do you call it, chart. Thank you. Because I'm going to, I'm going to ask questions and I want you to give me the answers. Uh, 
That's a source of craving, yes. Is the source of craving. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> We'll talk about it later. So, monks, with ignorance as conditions, with formations as condition, with consciousness as condition, with mentality, materiality as condition, With the sixfold base as condition, with contact as condition, with feeling as condition, with craving as condition, with clinging as condition, with habitual tendency or habitual behavior as condition, with birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair comes to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. This is an Asian way of learning the links of dependent origination. When you start doing that, you start hearing it more and it gets set a little bit easier when you... Uh, in Burma, when they teach the kids about dependent origination, they yell at the top of their lungs. <laughs> Okay, we have a reverse order questionnaire. With birth as condition, aging and death comes to be. So it was said, now monks, do aging and death have birth as condition or not? Or how do you take that in this case? Aging and death have birth as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With birth as condition, aging and death comes to be. With habitual behavior as condition, birth comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does birth have <coughs> habitual behavior as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Birth has habitual behavior as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With habitual behavior as condition, birth comes to be. With clinging as condition, habitual behavior comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does Habitual behavior have clinging as condition or not, or how do you take it in this case? Habitual behavior has clinging as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With clinging as condition, habitual behavior comes to be. With craving as condition, Clinging comes to be, so it was said. Now, monks, does clinging have craving as condition or not, or how do you take it in this case? Clinging has craving as condition, venerable sir. Thus, we take it in this case. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With feeling as condition, Craving comes to be, so it was said, Now, monks, does craving have feeling as condition or not, or how do you take it in this case? Craving has feeling as condition, venerable sir. 
Thus we take it in this case, with feeling as condition, craving comes to be. With contact as condition, feeling comes to be, so it was said. Now, monks, does feeling have contact as condition or not, or how do you take it in this case? Feeling has contact as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be, so it was said. Now, monks, does contact have the sixfold base as condition or not, or how do you take it in this case? Contact has full base as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be, so it was said. <clears throat> now, monks, does the sixfold base have mentality, materiality as condition or not, or how do you take it in this case? The sixfold base has mentality, materiality as condition, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With mentality, materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be. With the consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does mentality, materiality have consciousness as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Mentality, materiality has consciousness as its condition. Thus we take it in this case. With consciousness as condition, mentality, materiality comes to be. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. So it was said, now monks, does consciousness have formations or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Consciousness has formations as condition, venerable sir. Thus, we take it in this case. With formations as condition, consciousness comes to be. With ignorance as condition, formations comes to be. So it was said, now monks, do formations have ignorance as condition or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Formations have ignorance as condition, venerable sir. Thus, we take it in this case. With ignorance as condition, formations comes to be. Good monks, so you say thus, and I also say thus. When this exists, that comes to be. With the arising of this, that arises. That is, with ignorance as condition, with formations as condition, with consciousness as condition, with mentality, materiality as condition, with the sixfold base as condition, with contact as condition, with feeling as condition, craving comes to be. with craving as condition, with, comes to be. with clinging as condition, with habitual, to be. with habitual behavior as condition, with birth, comes to be. with birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, comes to be. Such is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Okay, by knowing how this works, then you can start seeing it 
and six Auring, each of these different ones. And that is the way that leads directly to Nibbana. A forward exposition on the cessation. But with the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance comes cessation of. With the cessation of formation, cessation of. With the cessation of consciousness, cessation of. With the cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of. With the cessation of the sixfold base, cessation of. With the cessation of contact, cessation of. With the cessation of feeling, cessation of. With the cessation of craving, cessation of. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of. With the cessation of habitual behavior, cessation of. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Now I'm just going to go through one or two of these reverse order questionnaire on cessation because they got into dot, dot, dot. And it's real hard to keep all of these things straight. So, with the cessation of birth, cessation of aging and death. So it was said, now monks, do aging and death cease with the cessation of birth or not? Or how do you take it in this case? Aging and death cease with the cessation of birth, venerable sir. Thus we take it in this case. With the cessation of birth, the cessation of aging and death comes to be. So, good monks, so you say thus, and I also say thus. When this does not exist, that does not come to be. With the cessation of this, that ceases. That is... With the cessation of ignorance comes the cessation of? Now think about this deeply. This is how all suffering stops. With the cessation of formations, the cessation of? With the cessation of consciousness, cessation of? With the cessation of mentality, materiality, cessation of? With the cessation of the sixfold base comes the cessation of? With the cessation of contact, cessation of? With the cessation of feeling, cessation of? With the cessation of craving, cessation of? With the cessation of clinging, cessation of? With the cessation of habitual behavior, cessation of? With the cessation of birth, cessation of? Aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. So think about your practice. And I say, when a feeling arises and you six are right then, what happens? Your craving does not come to be. And if craving doesn't come to be, clinging doesn't come to be. And if clinging doesn't come to be, And when habitual behavior doesn't come to be? With the, with the cessation of that, all of the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair at that time 
cease. So I, when, I, when I teach this to you, and, and I've been doing it from the first day, I've been telling you about feeling and craving and clinging and your habitual tendencies and your, your behaviors and that sort of thing and how you can let those go by the simple act of recognizing when feeling arises. And when your mindfulness is better and you start to calm down a little bit more, you can start to see the contact arise. And when you see the contact arise, the feeling won't arise. And when the feeling won't arise, craving won't arise. So, the craving that they're talking about it here in this is the capital C craving. But in every link of this dependent origination, it has the Four Noble Truths in it. And that is why you, you still need to use the six R's even with the more subtle thing because there's little tiny craving that still arises until you let go of formations. When you let go of formations, there is no more condition. And if there's no more condition, that means Nibbana, that you're, there's unconditioned, unfold your arms please, okay, now Nibbana can be described in a lot of different ways, but you can't really talk about Nibbana because the only kind of words and ideas that we have to describe it are conditioned. So I don't spend a lot of time trying to describe whether, oh, this is a happy state or not. That, don't, that doesn't work. You will be happy after you experience it, I promise you. But I don't know how to use words to describe what that experience is. So I don't really try. Okay, <clears throat> Okay. now we're going about personal knowledge. Monks, knowing and seeing in this way, would you run back to the past thus? Were we in the past? Were we not in the past? What were we in the past? How were we in the past? Having been what? What did we become in the past? You haven't got time to think about those kind of things because when you're seeing the links of dependent origination and you let them go, it has no meaning. There's no such a thing as a past. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you run forward to the future thus? What shall we be in the future? What shall we not be in the future? What shall we be... Oh, excuse me, I, I read the wrong sentence first. Shall we be in the future? Shall we not be in the future? What shall we be in the future? How shall we be in the future? Having been what? What shall we become in the future? Would you think about those kind of things? The same answer is no. It has no real meaning. 
Knowing and seeing in this way, would you now be inwardly perplexed about the present thus? Am I? Am I not? What am I? How am I? Where has this being come from? Where will it go? When you're seeing the links of dependent origination again, this doesn't have any real meaning. Because you're seeing how the process works. This is why the definition of mindfulness is so incredibly important. Observe, remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. How does that happen? What I'm really saying is, are you seeing how the links of dependent origination are working? And that's why we're more interested in how this process works we're a lot more interested than why is that? Why did this come up? Why doesn't matter? How do you see this process? And relax into it. Monks, knowing and this seeing in this way, would you speak thus? The teacher is respected by us. We speak as we do out of respect for the teacher. No, you wouldn't say that. Why? Who's your teacher? Yeah. You are. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you speak thus? The recluse says this, and we speak thus at the bidding of the recluse. No, you wouldn't say that. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you acknowledge another teacher? No. Why? Because you're your own teacher. You're teaching yourself how these links work. You're teaching yourself how to let go. And by doing that, you let go of suffering. Knowing and seeing in this way, would you return to the observances, tumultuous debates and auspicious signs of ordinary recluses and Brahmins, fortune tellers, things like that, taking them as the core of the holy life, I don't think so. Do you speak only of what you have known, seen, and understood by yourselves? Yes, venerable sir. Good monks, so you have been guided by me with this Dhamma, which is visible here and now immediately effective, inviting inspection, onward leading to be experienced by the wise for themselves. Again, that is talking about the Dhamma, but it's also saying that you have to see it for yourselves. And that's what I'm attempting to show you. So you can look and see for yourself how this process works. For it is re with reference to this that has been said, monks, this Dhamma is visible here and now, immediately effective. Every time you use the six R's, it is immediately effective which is a different thing than when I was practicing straight vipassana and I practiced it for about five years before I found out what it wasn't. <sighs> Inviting inspection, 
onward leading to be experienced by the wise for themselves. Monks, the descent of the embryo takes place through the union of three things. Here there is the union of the mother and father, but the mother is not in season and the coming being is not present. In this case, no descent of the embryo takes place. Here there is the union of the mother and father, and the mother is in season, but the coming being is not present. In this case, too, no descent of the embryo takes place. But when there is the union of the mother and father, and the mother is in season, and the coming being is present, through the union of these three things, the descent of the embryo takes place. The mother then carries the embryo in the womb for nine or ten months with much anxiety as a heavy burden. Nine or ten months. Nine months is by the sun calendar. Ten months is by the moon calendar. Then at the end of nine or ten months, the, monk, or the mother gives birth with much anxiety as a heavy burden. And then the when the child is born, she nourishes it with her own blood, for the mother's breast milk is called blood in the noble one's discipline. When he grows up and his faculties mature, the child plays at such games as toy plows, tip cat, somersaults, toy windmills, toy measures, toy carts, and toy bow and arrow. And, uh, <laughs> when he grows up and his faculties mature still further, the youth enjoys himself provided and endowed with the five chords <coughs> of sensual pleasure with forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. <coughs> Excuse me. Sounds cognizable by the ear that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Odors cognizable by the nose that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, <coughs> connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. <clears throat> Possessing that faith, he considers thus, household life is crowded and dusty, Life gone forth is wide open. It's not easy while well, living in a home to lead a holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard and put on the yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. On a later occasion, abandoning a small or large fortune, Abandoning a small or large circle of relatives, he shaves off his hair and beard, puts on the yellow robe, and goes forth from the home life into homelessness. Having thus gone forth and possessing a monk's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he abstains from killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside conscientious, merciful, and he abides compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning the taking of what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given. Taking only what is given, expecting only what is given. By not stealing, he abides in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy. 
living apart, abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. Abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world. Abandoning malicious speech, he abstains from malicious speech. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has learned here in order to divide those people from these nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those. Thus he, re <clears throat> he is one who reunites those who are divided, a prompter of friendship, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord, Abandoning harsh speech, this means cursing. He abstains from harsh speech. He speaks such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip, he abstains from gossip. He speaks at the right time, speaks what is fact, speaks on what is good, speaks on the Dhamma and discipline. At the right time, he speaks such words as are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. He abstains from injuring seeds and plants. He practices eating only one meal a day, abstaining from eating at night and outside the proper time. He abstains from dancing, singing, music, and theatrical shows. He abstains from wearing garlands, smartening himself with scent, and embellishing himself with unguents. He abstains from high and large couches. He abstains from accepting gold and silver. He abstains from accepting raw grain. He abstains from accepting raw, food, raw meat. He abstains from accepting women and girls. He abstains from accepting men and women slaves. He abstains from accepting goats and sheep. He abstains from accepting fowl and pigs. He abstains from accepting elephants, cattle, horses, and mares. He abstains from accepting fields and land. He abstains from going on errands and running messages. He abstains from buying and selling. He abstains from false weights, false metals, and false measures. He abstains from accepting bribes, deceiving, defrauding, and trickery. He abstains from wounding, murdering, murdering binding, brigandage, <coughs> plunder, and violence. He becomes content with robes to protect his body, with alms food to protect his stomach, and wherever he goes he sets out taking only these with him, such as a bird wherever he goes flies with its wings with its, as its only burden. So too the monk becomes content with robes to protect the body and with alms food to maintain the stomach. Wherever he goes, he sets out taking only these with him. Possessing the aggregate of noble virtue, he experiences within himself a bliss that is blameless. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not grasp at its signs and features. Since if he left the eye faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the eye faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with mind, he does not grasp at its signs and features. Since if he left mind faculty unguarded, 
evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the mind faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the mind faculty. Possessing this noble restraint of the faculties, he experiences within himself a bliss that is unsullied. He becomes one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning, who acts in full awareness when looking forward and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robe and carrying his outer robe and bowl, who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and tasting, who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating, who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. Full awareness of what you don't answer. What? No, it's full awareness of what mind is doing when you're doing these activities. That means being fully aware. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, this noble restraint of the faculties, and possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness, he resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. On returning from his alms round after his meal, he sits down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect, and establishes mindfulness before him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with the mind free from covetousness, purifies his mind from covetousness. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth and torpor, he abides free from sloth and torpor, mindful and fully aware. He purifies his mind from sloth and torpor. Abandoning restlessness and anxiety, he abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful. He purifies his mind from restlessness and anxiety. Abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about the wholesome states. He purifies his mind from doubts. <clears throat> Having abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana. With the stilling of thinking and examining thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana. With the fading away of joy, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. <coughs> With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not lust after it if it's pleasing. He does not dislike it if it's unpleasing. He abides with mindfulness of the body established. 6R. With an immeasurable mind, he understands as it actually is. 
the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom, wherein those evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. Having thus abandoned favoring and opposing, whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful, or neither painful nor pleasant, he does not delight in that feeling, welcome it, or remain holding to it. As he does not do so, delight in feeling ceases in him. With the cessation of delight comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving, cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of <clears throat> habitual behavior. With the cessation of habitual behavior, cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. On hearing a sound with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on, cog on cognizing a mind object with mind. He does not lust after it if it's pleasing. He does not dislike it if it's unpleasing. With the cessation of this like comes the cessation of craving. With the cessation of craving, cessation of clinging. With the cessation of clinging, cessation of <clears throat> habitual behavior. With the cessation of habitual behavior, cessation of birth. With the cessation of birth, aging, and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair cease. Such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering. Monks, remember this discourse of mine briefly as delivered in the destruction of craving. This is a very short sutta. Okay, when the Buddha would give a talk, it could last all night. And you didn't ho-hum your mind around, you paid attention to it. And he would, he would go through all of these things where the dot, dot, dots are and repeat everything so you could go over it and hear it and really have it set in. When you hear something three times, it starts to have an effect in the way you uh, can experience the meditation. So, but remember the monk Sati, son of a fisherman, as caught up in a vast net of craving in a trammel of craving. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. And I made it through without having another coughing fit. Not bad. <clears throat> the, the whole thing with Learning dependent origination, it is very helpful for you in your understanding of how things work. And when you start understanding precisely how things work, it's easy to let them go. Now you'll notice in every one of those links, there wasn't any mention of I, me, or mine. Why? They don't exist. Tomorrow night I'm going to give you a sutta that's probably one of the most powerful suttas you'll ever hear. And when you listen attentively 
And when when they listened attentively in Sri Lanka, there was two people that attained Nibbana just by listening to this. Oh, I've heard it a hundred times. I don't care. <laughs> Listen to it attentively. But it's boring. I want some other stuff. I want excitement. I don't want the same thing over and over again. Well, that's the way the Buddha taught. And he did it for a reason. So it's a real important thing for you to be very attentive. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Yes? determined um, in, to correct his, his um, misunderstanding about the possibility that consciousness survives from one, one life to another, from one new birth to another. Yes, and, and that's and impossible because of the way... For all the reasons that we could so attentively listen to. But what concerns me, what interests me, my question is, if consciousness ceases, when all of the nutrients of consciousness cease, what is there for? What is what? What I, I miss? I don't understand about rebirth, right? The consciousness does not carry over from one life to another, and then within one life, you can achieve nirvana. Why? Why would? There be rebirth. Why is rebirth necessarily? Because a lot of people don't understand this. So understand by seeing. I, I understand that it's that and that it's experiential. What I don't understand is what is the if if consciousness does not. I understand that consciousness does not carry over one life to another. So if it doesn't, why would there be such a thing? Why would there be such a thing? Karma. As, 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 as. The whole reason that you've been reborn lifetime after lifetime is the karmic effect and not understanding how it works. And if you do understand how it works? You get off the wheel. <coughs> no. Consciousness, it, it takes, there has to be a condition for consciousness to arise. Now the whole thing is, you're seeing the arising and passing away of consciousness. And when you get to a certain place in your meditation, you're seeing individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. And you see that there's, there's no one consciousness that runs and wanders through the rounds of rebirth, not anything else. That's what the difference between reincarnation and rebirth is. Rebirth is arising and passing away continually very fast. Okay? Okay. So it's just a karmic continuum. Yes. That's what is driving the whole That's yes. So in that case Papa we're not even um, one consciousness within one lifetime. Is right. You're rising and passing away. You're not the same person right now that you were at the start of the talk. Or even at the start of that sentence. Even at the, yeah, <laughs> right. Thank you, but that was very clear, Papa. Thank you. But I also had a little bit of a pernicious view emerge when you spoke about <laughs> earlier on. It was, I think, cleared up. Thank you. But when you mentioned that there was a mother and father in a, in a uh, Coming being. Right. Karma. Okay. 
that's not according to the Buddha's teaching. <clears throat> See, when, when Buddhism started moving into other countries, uh, they had to adopt some of the traditions and ideas and then they started inserting the Buddha's teaching into that and it, it got real confused in a lot of ways. I mean, the Tibetans, the Dalai Lama, he's a reincarnation of the last Dalai Lama. Well, the eighth Dalai Lama, uh, he was about 24, 25 years old. He decided he didn't want to be the Dalai Lama anymore and he disappeared. And after 25 years, they started looking around saying, well, he must be dead. Let's look for the new Dalai Lama. And they found one. And then the old Dalai Lama came back. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. yeah. And there, there was a major book that was written by uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, husband about that, that Dalai Lama in particular. It was, it was a real interesting thing. Aung San Suu Kyi, she was the, the lady that caused Burma to start turning around. Wow. Are you first? Sam? Um, the uh, longer sayings, uh, have you, are there any, have you studied the longer sayings as far as like undependent origination? Yes. And how long are they? I've I've read the other suttas in in the Digha Nikaya. It's it's not very much longer. I, actually, I don't think it's as long as this one. Okay. But the interesting thing in in the Digha Nikaya is that they don't use all of the links of dependent origination in their description. They don't use the sixfold base, and they don't use. Formations, I think. Yeah. Is, <clears throat> I've, I've just never been clear about this in the, uh, the 12 steps. Is uh, birth of action the same thing as physical birth, as in the birth? Can be. Of, oh, but not necessarily? Not necessarily. I mean, it, there, it, there's a, a lot of. <clears throat> I didn't bring the book out with me, but there's, uh, in the Samyut Nikaya, there's a definition of each one of those terms, and there's a lot of different definitions. And this is one that is very, very practical. That's why we use it. But it is talking about the birth of beings, and that sort of thing. Of course, it's easy for me to see how, how being born leads to dying. <laughs> that's, that's, that, even I can understand that. <laughs> but uh, but now, the steps preceding that are ones that um, I'm experiencing you know, right now, or that I'm yeah. continually craving and claiming, all the personal ones, yeah. because you have them color-coded very helpfully there. Um, so that's just has always led to confusion for me. Um, how it's a See, there's and claiming are being experienced before birth, or have I just got that all? Well, there's different levels of understanding of the the links of dependent origination. There's a general, and that that actually is a very general description, and then you can get much more specific in exactly how this process does work. The consciousness there is the potential for consciousness to arise when conditions are right for it. When the six sense doors are there and there's contact. 
things like that. And formations lead to consciousness? Well, formations are body, speech, and mind. Those are the three formations. That's the potential for all of this stuff to occur. You can't have all any of the other links if you don't have body, speech, and mind, right? But they might occur at different times, not necessarily in that order. Okay. So, yeah, pondering that more, I, I've always thought of formations as being an urge, just that little no. bit of a direction, is that? That's a personal idea of it, okay. <laughs> but it's impersonal. It arises because of past karma. So it's not an urge, it's, it's something because of the karmic effect of past actions. So the birth of action creates more karma. Of course. And so does your habitual behavior and so does craving and clinging and yeah. So that is is that what's meant by looking when we can be yes. They're different. different. Yeah. Sankara is formations. Karma is cause and effect. And each one of these links has karma in it. I mean that let's get might as well get a little bit more uh Confusing. <laughs> I learned this in Kunai's the verb. The what? The verb consciousness. Kunya. How do you say that? Cognizance. 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 Sorry? Cognizance. Right. You, you recognize? That means you're using your memory to bring up something so that your mind can cognize it, can see it. So when it says consciousness cognizes, it doesn't yes. make sense to me at this moment. Consciousness. Consciousness. Well, it cognizes, it, it knows, it understands. I haven't really run across a better one, no, no. but that doesn't mean there isn't. It's to know, yeah. It's when you cognize something, you see it in the present. When you recognize something, you remember it from a past action. Recognizing, releasing, and relaxing. When we're recognizing, we're that really one step behind the actual action yes. of knowing. Right. So we're, it's like knowing and re-knowing, or so to cognize and recognize, in a sense, chasing our tail. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's see, at, at my cootie I have five or six different dictionaries. I have a book of etymology and I have five or six um, thesauruses. And I spend a lot of time with that, looking for better words to describe. Because the translation, um, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation came from Yanamoli, a lot of it. And Yanamoli was trying to make one word for Pali with one word for English. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I haven't... Uh, I haven't looked at Cognize for a long time, so I'll have to go back and see what I can find. Patience, patience. <laughs> Yes. The other the other words around it, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's really true. That's and true. that's why we're having a Pali scholar come for part of the summer. And this this monk is He's got a truly amazing mind. He knows uh, Devanagari, uh, the, the basic language of uh, India, Sanskrit, Pali, English, and Sri Lankan. And he's 25 years old. Huh? Kusala, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that at the same time? Is that is that a skillful way to view it? I don't know if you can do it really at the same time. Well, because they're 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 pretty general terms, but when you're seeing it for yourself and and recognizing it as what it is, uh, you're seeing it in in the micro very closely. The macro, it, it's like you just pick up something and it says, okay, this is dependent origination, and it just talks in general terms. It's not specific, like what I'm showing you. Yeah, I, yes, I understand that. I, okay. People who study or understand Buddhism from some point of view think that this applies only to the macro only to birth. Well, that's because of the that's only because of the Visuddhi Magga. And we don't really get along with the Visuddhi Magga as well as a lot of other people do. What is that? The Magga is a commentary that was written a thousand years after the Buddha died. And he was a Pali scholar but he didn't know anything about meditation. And he wrote a book <coughs> describing meditation. Okay. I mean, I remember looking up a bit of meditation in the Vasudhi Mahatma. Yeah. yeah. Contemplation would be that. Yeah. I was thinking about this in the term in the past that goes in Nirvana to the fourth jhana. It always sounded to me like if you start waking up in past lives that you look at a macro level versus like if you started going to these 
It's not how it works like that. We'll discuss that privately. Okay. Yeah. How can you recollect past lives if consciousness doesn't yeah. cross over? Do you remember what happened yesterday? Yeah. Past life, isn't it? <laughs> so what it is is remembering. <laughs> it's just developing your memory right. in a particular way. <coughs> That's different than what? It's it's not the same consciousness that arises and passes away. No. suggesting that at all because it's continually arising and, and it's birth death birth death birth death birth death there's nothing immortal about it <laughs> but you do have a memory you do have a memory of it and you you do have memory do you remember what you did five years ago do you remember what you did ten years ago that's how you start developing your memory so that you can Is your memory karmic? No, it isn't. No. Well, it's memory. That's all it is. It's remembering. You had past experiences. Are you the same person that you were 35 years ago? No, you're not the same person now. But you can remember. What difference does it make how many years ago it is? the next, it's the next, the next. And so you get the effect down there, but it's a whole different domino. Okay, it's the only thing I can believe. That's the well, only thing I can believe. Where was I before I was here? That's the question. Where else is that? <laughs> but it's impersonal. So it goes back to essence or no essence, is that? If, if each consciousness is unique and conditioned by itself, it comes into existence and it goes out of right. existence. There is no essential quality of mind. Because that's the only way we can know mind is through consciousness. So therefore there is no essence. I mean, just analytically stated. Is, is that the Buddhist argument? I don't know. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Honest. <laughs> I don't know. It's just opinion. Yeah, it, that's what it, it's, it turns into philosophy, and philosophy is words without any action behind them. And that turns into opinion, and you can start wars on that kind of stuff. But does it really matter? That's the one. There won't be any wars if you say I'm right. Or you can just say it's just the same as on the other side. Right. There are ways that we can open our minds that can transcend time and space. And if in that process you were choosing to remember past lives, and that could be just a portion of the information that you could access. Well, now you're getting into things that's going away from what the Buddha was teaching. So I and, and I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> I know I know that there are people that.
personally, I, you know, that self is the problem. It is, absolutely. And the point of seeing clearly would be so you don't do that. You don't do and that. You end up suffering. That's it. So with the memory of previous lives, one gets the realization that they're completely impersonal experiences because they, you don't identify that as you, it's the memory. No, the, most people do identify it as them and that's okay. what the problem is. Okay, okay. <coughs> The advantages of remembering past lifetimes is you get to see that karma is a real thing. Because of your past actions. Okay. Let's share some merit there. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas and mighty powers share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation.